and welcome to Eat Sleep Code, the official Telerik podcast. I'm your host, Ed Charbonneau, and with me every week is my good friend, John Bristow. How you doing, John? Every week, you make that sound like a jail sentence. It is. It's, you know, a jail my sentence. My community, that is, uh, community contributions. <laughs> it is paid out on a weekly basis. That's right. With, with no end in sight. Serving my time. Uh, we've got some interesting articles for the week as we do on the show. The first one I, I grabbed, uh, by the way, I tried to split these up. I did a little bit of extra show prep this week. Hopefully oh, hey, it pays off go. worse. Nice. Um, Getting all fancy on us, you know? I know. I know this two-bit right? production. <laughs> yeah, here, we can see this list oh, here. Oh, my goodness. This is, Look at you. I've got them divided up here. So we've got wow. some of our scripting things. Um, I've got some kind of other languages here, too. These aren't permanent God, fixtures. You're the envelope, Ed. You're using but, bullet points. Uh, I know this. This should help at least organize the show and and stuff. Here, I'll publish this out too. Hey, uh, let's get that going. It's this week's important links, folks. Yes. Clack, Nothing clack, like clack, clack, clack. how the how the sausage is made here. We've got we've got TypeScript today. Uh huh. A little bit of Rust. We've got Rust. Well, we've got .NET. Lots of .NET. Um, uh, there is some developer tooling as well. Yep. Why wouldn't there be? I love watching the hashtags come up. I'm like, who is using that hashtag? <laughs> I know, right? So there, there's our links. We'll share those out. Those are on my, my LinkedIn page. You can find those there. Uh, so we'll start with some JavaScript -y stuff. There, there, I did uh, some JavaScript with Catherine on our Code It Live channel this week. It was a lot of fun. I talked about functional programming. There's actually a couple new things that are in all the browsers now. So there, there was some new stuff to share as far as like uh, array uh, operations. So. For a long time, if you called sort on an array in JavaScript, it would um, mutate the array. Mm. And uh, now in in the browser, you can do two sorted, which is a non-destructive sort. And you can also do reverse, two reversed versus the old school reversed. So, so does they're, it make they're, a copy? They make a copy now. Mm. Um, so there's a couple new events there. We talked about those and did a lot of exercises around uh, functional programming with arrays, uh, how to you know map, reduce, sort, all that stuff very cleverly yep. and writing yep. your code where it's easy to read. So it got me on the topic, and I saw this come across the wire. This was uh, shared uh, by Isaac Levin. I picked that up from him. But uh, this is a blog post by Rick Strahl. Um, Brilliant developer. He makes the uh, Markdown Monster tool that I absolutely love. Yep. And uh, I guess he's updating some of the uh, JavaScript that goes behind the scenes in Markdown Monster. And he's converting his uh, synchronous code to async code using um, the async await operators in JavaScript. Yep. And as he's converting this code, there was some unexpected behavior. So, uh, you know, if you're doing any kind of front end development with JavaScript, you've probably run into this event argument prevent default before. Mm -hmm. What that does is it stops event handlers from triggering. Um, for example, I think what he's doing in here is, and I'm paraphrasing, um, there's some sort of process going on and he, he's disabling links for a moment while this thing processes. So you don't navigate away from whatever it's doing by clicking on a link that's in the browser. And, uh, when he started converting this code and, and he even writes it out here, like there's only like two lines of code that actually get changed. Right. And uh, one of those is just this await operator he adds here and async in the function. So async, await, and then all of a sudden all the prevent defaults stopped working. So it broke a bunch of his code um, and it comes to, he, you know, realizes as he debugs this that um, the way state is handled uh, the function kicks off um, and completes before it reaches 
the um, the the code beneath the await. So there there's some workarounds that have to take place. Like you have to restructure some of your code when you're doing async await apparently in JavaScript because um, of the order of operations in which things will execute. So. It's an interesting blog post. It's nice because he ran into an issue and solved it and then blogged about it. So the next person to step on this landmine can kind of avoid it. Um, you know. Yeah, my, my recollection of, of prevent default is that you have to call it before you call a wait. Your yeah, first yeah, that's what he was. He actually ended up doing here. So um, in the synchronous code, it didn't really matter because it's, mm. you know, all of this stuff gets compiled or parsed and then executed uh where the await in this situation was before the prevent default oh right okay yep so it's gonna await this and then it's gonna return here and then execute and then it's too late to prevent the the events from happening because they they happened above the await code here so gotcha if you want to prevent things during the await they have to be declared before the await happens so interesting stuff Thought that was cool. Uh, very topical considering my week I've had. So <laughs> continued on. Uh, There's there another interesting one that I stumbled upon. Um, advanced JavaScript functions to improve code quality. Um, these are things that you probably might find in a library or on NPM as packages, but uh, this um, Paul New Lists, I want to call it. I want to say his name is, sorry for butchering your last name, my friend. Uh, he put them in uh, just in a blog post. So you could easily just find those and add them to your code if you want them. Uh, and there's stuff in here that I've I've used all the time. And I always have to look it up on like Stack Overflow or some dark place on the web like that. Uh, we've got debounce. Um, so this is, um, this is super helpful if you have an event that's triggering all the time and you, you want to control how rapidly that event can fire. Um, this example here is, you know, clicking on buttons, but I, I find this even more helpful if you're like, maybe you're, you're typing into an, uh, autocomplete box. Um, you don't want that autocomplete box calling out to your server, causing, uh, web API requests, or even worse, you know, SQL queries being run yep. as the person types each letter, right? So you want to debounce those things. Um, and then there's the flip side of debounce, which is throttle. So mm -hmm. throttle and debounce, um, I might get these backwards, but debounce is like you're typing and you want to wait for the user to stop type of scenario before it executes a request throttle it's the opposite way it's going to initiate the request and then you would say keep typing um, and then uh, a certain time would go by before it issue that request again incidentally throttle and debouncer is the name of my uh 1980s to 2023 synth cover band so like <laughs> bang and olsen or hollow notes <laughs> no i got i gotcha um, this is a, another one that's pretty interesting. I haven't run across a use case for this myself, but I'm sure there's plenty of use cases for it. Uh, once, um, you want a method that can be called once and only once. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe you're trying to prevent this from being called twice for some reason, um, and this kind of puts a lock on it. Once it's called, it's not going to be called, uh, be able to be called again. It gets bypassed. Um, he notes in here it's uh, use useful for event listeners that you don't, you know, want to have to go back and clean up and remove, but uh, maybe you just want to uh, allow this to only fire one time. Yeah, the amount of times I've seen like my parents double click buttons on a <laughs> web page, you know. <laughs> yeah, like uh, you can only submit the transaction one time in your your Walmart account, you know, your cart. Um, Memoize, uh, this is uh, kind of caching for uh, a function. I uh, won't we'll go into too much explanation on that, but it's going to save you time and processing power by caching. Uh, Curry, this one, um, this is an interesting one because it's possible without the function. You can curry in C sharp or um, in C sharp, yeah. You can curry in JavaScript though um, without this function. Um, this might be nice for syntactic sugar, 
I don't know, uh, to have a function that you literally pass the word curry into. But you can do this with just double lambda arrows or fat arrows. I keep making yep. that mistake too. I, I, I was driving Catherine nuts, I think, with that. They are fat arrows. Or, you know, if you want to be nice. I, Come on. I like we thick. Be, we got, yeah. I like thick arrows myself. I'm a, I'm a thick arrows kind of guy. But okay. um, yeah, the you can curry um, without this, but you know maybe you want that as a, a like I said, syntactic sugar or something. So All there's right. some good stuff in here. There's partial that goes with currying pipe. Uh, that's also a really great one um, mm. because you don't have the um, kind of extension method quality that you do with C-sharp that you you don't have in, in JavaScript. So you could use this pipe operator or pipe function to get kind of that um, that method chaining that you don't quite get in JavaScript unless it's something that's on the prototype already. Uh, so there's lots of good stuff in here anyway. Compose, pick, uh, omit, uh, zip. I think this one's actually included, by the way, now in the language, so you may not need this one anymore. I think that one is called sp spliced, too spliced is the new version of it. So okay. check that out as well. Anyway, bunch of great stuff in there. I thought that was really a uh, nice post. Um, not only writing these all out, uh, you normally like stash these away in your, your GitHub or gist somewhere and forget to share them with your friends. And uh, he wrote a nice blog post outlining each one of these and, and shared them with everybody. So. Good stuff there. Awesome. Uh, so while we're on the subject of scripting language, script, JavaScript, TypeScript, all of that stuff, what is uh, what is this TS reset all about, John? This is something that you posted in the, the show yeah, notes. Yeah, so uh, Matt Pocock uh, published this. He's uh, he's he's with uh, the he's ex Vercel. Uh, he's um, he's a TypeScript educator. And uh, he wrote this a while ago. Uh, sorry, he wrote this earlier. Um, when I say a while ago, like er, like earlier this month. Sorry. Um, so he he wrote this because he was getting frustrated with what was happening uh, to some like his arrays and other things that he found were a little bit um, difficult to use in in the world of of uh, TypeScript. So in the name is kind of an homage to CSS reset. So CSS reset is this sort of um, primer for for CSS processing by browsers because they all have different defaults. Mm -hmm. And so what he did was he said it basically acts the same way. So TS reset will basically smooth out all the hard edges that TypeScript has in regards to a variety of things and allows you to opt into exactly which improvements you want. So for example, like, um, you know, json.parse returning any um, or, um, you know, rather than returning like something unknown or um, the way that, uh, you know, array.filter works or things like that. So it goes through a list of sort of resets that, that can be done. And there's a set of rules there. And uh, I thought for folks who are basically working with TypeScript uh, may want to check this out. Yeah. Yeah, the, the good old any keyword. Got to watch out for that one. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> it's always a good time. Um, you know, you wish it wasn't like this, but I guess it's... Um, you know, there are, I mean, there are reasons why the initial sort of uh, implementations like this, but just the nature of the beast, I guess, when people have different different defaults that they want to use. All right, let's move on to a little bit of uh, AI talk for a second, John. I thought oh, this God. was um, <laughs> <laughs> this was actually a good a good post. Um, this is by the CEO of Pinterest. I don't know if yep. this is. Uh, some white knighting by by the Pinterest CEO, or if this is actually what they're doing over at Pinterest um, in their philosophy. But uh, he's comparing other social media websites' use of AI to kind of the addictive nature of big tobacco. Like the you know, big tobacco is like the big tobacco companies that have kind of preyed on on people's addictive behaviors with their product. Mm. Um, kind of predatory consumerism, and uh, he's he's kind of throwing um, search providers and some other folks under the bus uh, with uh, Microsoft and Google and Open API and and these sort of things, 
And uh, there's a good comparison in here that I, I like. Uh, let's see if I can find it and highlight what he's talking about. There it is. Um, they at uh, Pinterest would like to have their AI be more additive rather than addictive content. That's so right. rather than f uh, promoting things that feed you to just click and scroll through more content, they want things that add more value. Uh, and I, I think that it kind of relates to our show a bit. Like we're kind of doing this manually, right? Where no what you're saying, no one's addicted to our content. <laughs> we're, we're the ones that are doing this manually. Like we could easily get this, you know, get news out of our Google feed or whatever it is. Um, uh, you know, everybody has these, these AI things, uh, recommending content to them, yep. but, uh, we're, we're taking a few minutes here to kind of sift through things that we think are interesting to other people and, and trying to add some more value to it and share it in a meaningful way, rather than just like go for clicks, go for thumbs up, uh, share clickbait headlines, that sort of thing. I, I think that's kind of what what he was trying to get across there is they're gotcha. they want to they want to have their content be more enjoyable not just go for popularity because sure. so yeah, i thought the, it was a pretty the, good read the algos the algos that these sites have are definitely geared towards uh, aligning to your interests and thus we have what's called the attention economy i've seen a lot of documentaries mm -hmm. about this um sure yeah if they can figure out how to make this more additive and recognize when when content is genuine then yeah i'm in favor of it yep all right john switching gears a little bit uh we've got some other language stuff to talk about um yeah this is a go post you're our resident go expert so i'll oh, let God. you take the wheel my, my uh yeah let's let's not drive off the cliff here <laughs> so um go 120 has been out for a bit um and there was a number of language changes that came along for the ride and the one that um is uh that's in there that i like is the what was called the pre-declared comparable type constraint and so until uh 120 um there were some types in the go language that weren't um, <clears throat> satisfying this constraint and so they provide an example where if you have like uh, a map slice uh of any index by any um the, the any the any keyword is like um is kind of like a generic that allows you to basically propagate anything you can you can utilize an empty um, interface for that as a substitute but with generics you can specify any and so what they talk about here is how they can uh, now make strict um comparable types with this so that you're not you, you don't get these compile time errors as part of the language um comparable types are are prevalent in a lot of different languages i mean it's not just go that's doing this you see this across a lot of different languages but um, the reason why I think this is going to be a benefit going forward just makes the language a little bit more strict, a little bit more compliant. And so comparable types, I think, um, allows you to apply these to, you know, obviously comparables for like equals and things of that nature, which is always a good thing. Um, but if you're doing anything with Go, upgrading to 120 um, should mitigate a little bit of this edge behavior that you may see. Um, of course, you still have, <laughs> you still have um, the challenge of, you know, satisfying against um, the interface implementation. Um, but um, yeah, going forward, it should uh, should definitely get better as we go through this, so. Switching over to Rust a little bit, Rust Sitter. Yeah, so there is a nice little library called Tree Sitter. And tree, what Tree Sitter does is it allows you to create what are called grammars. So you might wonder what the heck are you talking about here? So. This is um, a tool that I've looked at. So when you create a language or you create, um, if, if you want to understand what a language, how a language is constructed, you need to define a grammar. A grammar is like, um, when people think of grammars, they think of typically an abstract syntax tree and they think of what we'll mm -hmm. call an AST, et cetera. And we, we were looking at this. The reason why I thought this was interesting was because I'll, I'll get to Rusted in a second. I have to provide the backstory. We wrote a VS Code extension at Octopus and one of the things that we were looking at is we have a we have a configuration language called OCL, uh, which stands for Octopus Configuration Language. And when we wrote that, we were thinking, okay, how do we how do we parse this sucker? You know, like how do we parse the language inside? And so we thought about, okay, we'll create an AST and we looked at a variety of tools. And then we stumbled across this thing called Tree Sitter. Now mm -hmm. we didn't we didn't do this because it was a bit of a a bit of a, a hobby project that we were doing, but um, at 
the long view of this was we definitely wanted to do this. Now, tree sitter aside, tree sitter, the way it works is it's it's based. What it does is it would evaluate um, uh, the execution of uh, your your JSON configs and then generate a C based implementation of your grammar for that, and then you can use mm -hmm. that anywhere. Um, what Rust sitter is is the same idea but implemented in Rust, and so I thought this was very interesting because obviously. Um, Rust has um, if equal sort of performance characteristics, highly type safe, et cetera. Um, so it's kind of the same thing. So you can define grammars now uh, in Rust and utilize attributes to mark them up. So if you're looking, basically the bottom line is, and this is probably like super edge case, you're never going to really do this as a sort of everyday developer. But mm -hmm. if you are looking to define a grammar for, say, a custom file format and you want to say add an extension support within VS code you can do that now by defining a grammar in either tree sitter or now rust sitter yeah so these are actually really interesting um if you're if you ever have done any theme uh custom theme building for visual right. studio code mm. uh because you need this syntax highlighting feature um that this tree the the, the ast provides you yeah, so, so the way that you, the way that works is like you have to understand what element you're hovering on to, or mm -hmm. basically to process the the basically process document. You need the ST. The fastest way to do that is to generate a grammar. Basically, you can do it programmatically. You can go like through a bunch of if statements, but it's going to be a nightmare to maintain. Sorry, I interrupted. Yeah, so you end up uh, with something that looks like this in Visual Studio Code. Uh, so there's a file that sits off in your theme, and it has a bunch of these in it. So you may have something that is looking for uh, a certain scope, and then there's maybe a file type, but there's also like uh, some sort of pattern it's matching, or maybe there's something yeah. in the language it's matching. So this is what we did. We did this, and the way it works is it uses what are called TextMate um, grammars, basically. So TextMate is a text editor. And one of the things that they did way back in the day, TextMate's an old, old sort of Mac OS oriented IDE text editor. And they defined this notion of what are called grammars because they needed this, right? And so Visual Studio has that built into it out of the box. You can import a TextMate grammar, which is based on regex. But the problem is, is that it's based on regex. Right. <laughs> so it becomes a bit of a nightmare. Yeah, the the uh, language services that are in Visual Studio Code will help you with this. So you can kind of click and highlight things and it will help you generate something. But you end up with something like this where it's like, here's your theme and we're looking for keywords in whatever language this is. Sure. And we're going to put this color on them. Um, and then there's other types of things that it might highlight. And I ended up making one of these for Blazor at one point oh, because nice. the custom theme that I rolled... Uh, wasn't highlighting Blazor components, yep. um, but they are very similar to uh, HTML markup, but you could identify them um, in a, inside the editor. So it was it was creating a flag for it, and it was like, this isn't HTML, it's something .NET-y. It knew that much, but it didn't have a theme for that, that element it was identifying. So I went and added those to my theme, and it, and it would highlight I, them. I have a lot of experience building um, this stuff, and my... So if you're going to do this, first, first, first and foremost, know that it's a little tricky, but it's definitely doable. The second thing is this is based on a thing called a language server protocol or LSP. And that doesn't mean you have to use just VS code. LSPs are supported by Sublime Text and by, well, we used to be known as Atom. I guess Atom's no longer a thing, but VS code, VS, et cetera, et cetera. And so LSPs allow you, the LSP allows you to basically define these things. And what that means is that it's IDE independent. The other thing is, is that once you go down this rabbit hole, it gets really gnarly. Um, there's a lot of things you can do with, uh, with these IDEs. Uh, text editors around syntax highlighting, IntelliSense, code completion, blah, 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 blah. Like there's all this sort of structure to it. You need, you absolutely 100% need an AST to even, a grammar to even figure out what the heck uh, you're talking about. Yeah, this is what it looks like in Visual Studio, by the way. Yeah. Let's yeah. see if I can get this zoomed in a little bit. That's so it. It, yep. you highlight this, there's a, there's a, key combination you press in Visual Studio Code and you enable this feature. And then when you hover over something, it's like, okay, this function name is from TypeScript and we're applying these colors to it based yep. on your theme. Yep. Um, and then there's the semantic token. It's a function. 
Uh, it's an async function. And then it has like the fully namespaced qualifier. It's like entity yeah. name dot functions dot TS. So you can look for all of these things inside of your theme and then make it apply something based on what it's finding. And like I was saying, the, the one that I had, I think it was like, it thought it was HTML, but then it had like something in the namespace that was coming in with .NET. And it was like, okay, with these things, I can qualify this as Razor. Yep. And I was able to pick those out uh, accurately one, and one thing highlight on them. This, um, one thing on this is that if you use TextMate um, uh, grammars, uh, it falls down the second you try to mix languages. So in the case of like, say, a web document, if you've got um, if you've got HTML, CSS, and JavaScript all intermixed and you want syntax mm -hmm. highlighting for each one of them, it, it gets really, really tricky. And you can't use, yeah. TextMate, you can't use TextMate grammars uh, really easily in that space. And you have to roll uh, a grammar yourself and process it yourself. So at one point, um, the Razor feature in... Um in Visual Studio, it was described in the Visual Studio, not Visual Studio Code, before they like kind of refactored this all out to a language service and stuff. The um, it was presented to me as in the editor. There's literally a pop up that has like the um, the HTML. There's a pop up that has. Yep. The CSS, there's a pop-up yep. that has <laughs> the JavaScript, there's a pop-up that has the Razor, like theoretically pop-ups, you know what I mean? Yeah. Inside of this, you know, wherever you're highlighting, like mm. if, if you're highlighting this function, like you would get all of these things and it, oh, it was yeah. internally trying to figure out which one of these to surface because you can intermingle those four different code bases in one file. And um, I'm sure it drove some really brilliant engineers crazy trying to get it all right. But uh, I think Ryan Nowak was one of the people working on that at the time. And uh, he was describing the the pitfalls that he had to go through to get this thing to work right. And um, it was pretty, pretty amazing that they got it to work. Yeah, to be successful in that space, you just got to kill that part of your soul that isn't dead yet. <laughs> He doesn't work on it anymore, so I don't know if it was just it broke him or if they just uh, wanted to repurpose him on another team or yep, yep. who let's, knows. Let's save him. Let's let, like he's yeah. torturing himself. Yep. Um, I don't do C++, but it, this came across my feeds, and I thought it might interest some folks. Um, this is the 2.0 of their package management ecosystem. So Conan 2.0 is out. Um, so I, I've not dove into C++ and package management at all. So I don't know um, how significant this is, but I thought I'd bring it up. Uh, it looks like they've got a new CLI and um, the they've got package immutability. All the things you'd want out of a modern package management system are in uh, inside of this 2.0 release of uh, Conan. So it looks like it's like a pretty... Uh, relatively new tool in the scope of C++'s history. Uh, came out in 2016 and a uh, major revision here in 2023. So this is new stuff for C++, one of those age-old languages that's still around today. It's from the folks at JFrog. They know a thing or two about packages. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, they've got Artifactory, as people know. And, um, yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. I mean, I don't touch C or C plus plus. So, I mean, I'm like, I'm like Seinfeld. I'm like, good luck with all that. <laughs> yeah, people, people at conferences I talk to all the time. They're like, yeah, I'm do, yeah, I still do C plus plus. You know, for yeah. these things on top of the .NET or on top of the JavaScript or on top of whatever. So uh, there's still many, many developers out there doing that stuff. Um, probably many of them looking at Rust. I. Uh, Switching things up a little bit, still on languages, though, uh, we've got my favorite three lines of CSS. Um, yeah. Th this is not literally my favorite three lines. It's the name no. of the article here, but uh, no. what, what yeah, are we talking so this about? Is, uh, this was written by Andy Bell. He's a pretty pretty popular front-end developer. Uh, he's based in the UK. Uh, he's built a ton of amazing websites. And uh, he wrote, he wrote um, an article 
a while back. Uh, there's a site called A List Apart, which a lot of web devs would know. Um, and he makes reference to um, basically there's a there's a site called Every Layout, which talks about how to um, it's a it's a course that talks about how to write um, basically really good CSS. And mm -hmm. one of the things that they talk about there is this thing called the stack. And the stack is this notion of basically how to structure um, CSS in such a way that allows it to um, uh, it's a it's a layout that allows primitive uh, primitive index margins between elements with a common parent and it uses this thing which I had never heard of before which was awesome called the lobotomized owl selector so you see that uh, lobotomized see that, owl yeah you see so stay stay right there you see that thing oh, yeah. Is at, yeah that's that's called the lobotomized owl selector because and, um, it it dates but well it, 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 an owl would be like, well if you click on the link that's uh you see how it's this or something um, well a little bit it looks like it looks a little bit like that but if you look at the link that he he included which is a, basically a link to a list apart it talks about how the 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 focus for the lobotomized owl selector looks like asterisks plus asterisks and basically what it it's basically a select style um um uh, it's basically a selector that allows you to qualify uh, certain elements and um, very popular for its performance. And um, mm -hmm. it's basically, um, you know, a way to grab a, a specific type of elements. And when you use in conjunction with the stack, which is this notion of structuring out content, um, and you define it as an element, then you get this really nice placement of, of, I, of elements within your uh, yeah. document. I'm so. trying to read through this. It's like this is the anything that is a child of stack that is star plus star plus is gosh, I'm trying to remember what plus is in it's a sibling selector, right? Uh God, it's been a while. So, so it's, 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 it's a it's any an adjacent element sibling adjacent sibling combinator, I believe. Yeah. So it's any any sibling uh, or any child of this, and also any sibling of it's this. Fantastic. I just love the name. So yeah, and then uh, this is actually this is actually new here as well. So margin block start. This is the new syntax for margin. So if you're if you got the box, um, your uh, margin would be on the outside. Padding would be on the inside. Mm -hmm. um so margin oh, of course it's going to move my cursor around awesome. me. i love i love the fact you're going to draw this and zoom it <laughs> yeah so the margin is on, on this outside box here uh padding would be on the inside box there um and the reason we're using margin start so we used to use margin like in a number or you might say margin top mm like that like, eh, five pixels or something yeah whatever um what? this the the concept of top here uh assumes that you know which direction your layout starts from so there's top but there's new modifiers now um i'm trying to remember what the the name of this is but basically you can say um you know we have a language that is uh read from right to left and then we may also want to change this from uh, right to left to or top to bottom to bottom to top. So the concept of top doesn't apply anymore because it's not the top anymore. It's you know you've you've flipped the uh, the layout over. So um, there's new terminology, uh, new syntax here. So it's margin start, margin block start. And that basically is going to be, I believe, the top, what we would we would previously consider the top. Um, and then if you flip your layout upside down, um, I can't remember the name of that property that does it, but if you change the layout from a bottom to top layout, start still has the same meaning as it would have before. So uh, there's that, and then there's margin inline, and margin inline is going to be right to left. So if you were to go like to a right to left hand side language, you'd still have margin start would be on the appropriate side of the layout. Uh, what would be the applicable reason for flipping things upside down? 
Um, I'm trying to remember if there's any languages that are bottom up. Um, let me see real quick here. Languages. Red, bottom to top. There are, are there any languages that are red bottom to top? There are, in fact, some languages that are red bottom to top. So I, I don't know which languages exactly they are. It says like a lot of them are ancient languages. Um, maybe Star Wars scrolling <laughs> intros. Uh, there are languages. There's a Quora here. I'm trying to not display things just in case searches come out haywire and yep um show us your browser so, history ed come on so here here we go there there are some phonetical script languages that are read from bottom to top so there there is that there is that so this is what that might look like wow see how that goes there um and i've actually used this feature before so uh See, we're, we're getting pretty close on time, but um, let me see if I can I can find this as we move on here. So I'll, I'll try to watching, fire this up and I'll... I love watching you tap dance. <laughs> I will circle back to this, but I'm pretty sure I have used this before. And um, yeah, but the, that's where this comes from. So the three favorite lines, I don't even think we got to that. So there, he's using some variables here and then... We get like a nice white space, maintainable white space. Is that what this is all about? That's part of it. It's part of structuring of the elements within that. So, and that's part of what they call the stack, which is um, an es espoused by um, this article. Yeah, there's um, there's a, a lot of like interesting things that you could do with white space on the web, sure. uh, and coming up with a f like. A framework, and I don't mean like framework like Bootstrap, just like a uh, semantically speaking, like a framework uh, for managing white space is really important. Um, so, you know, you can do something easy like this, like uh, like you say, this is like my favorite three lines in JavaScript, or I mean in CSS, right? Um, because if you have a uh, white space that's managed with something easy like this. You don't have to fall back on something like uh, Tailwind, and you don't have like a bunch of code, in, like tail, Tailwind. I bless your hearts for for loving Tailwind, folks. Not my favorite thing. So much um, hate. So, much so hate. in Tailwind, you have these things like Mara M two P one. I don't know. There's a bunch of you know, a bunch of these little shorthand things that are my battleship. <laughs> yeah, and they they mean like margin and padding, but you don't really know. I don't know. But I've seen people. I've literally seen code like this. Like no joke. Um, there, I've I've had to edit code where somebody's gone like M four, and then somewhere in their CSS they're like this this thing. Uh, I can't get it to the white space, right? So the margin, uh, you know, 10 pixels, yep. important. Z index 9,900. And it's like, okay, if you, if you just didn't use this on the HTML that you're selecting, then you wouldn't need this or, or definitely wouldn't need this, right? Because what yep. you're doing is you're overriding the the thing that you lost track of in Tailwind uh, because... Ed, how, how do you think we get things done? We hack. We do what <laughs> God intended. We hack. <laughs> it's like somebody's writing the HTML and putting these things in and then somebody else is writing the CSS and they're fighting against this framework that somebody's adopted. And it, it just, it's cringe seeing it right. sometimes. Uh, I've seen that in production and had to try to fix it. So, hmm. yeah. Um, tried to fix it. Emphasis yeah. on try. Well, I mean, the the solution is to not use frameworks that fight with CSS. But um, anyway, <laughs> anyway, uh, let's see. Ah, here we go. Here we go. I found my code. I found my code. Boop. There we are. So here is the uh, writing mode. So I used it to create some vertical vertical text, writing mode, vertical, right to left. Nice. 
Um, and then, of course, you got to rotate that 180 degrees. So there's actually a reason for this. Um, if I run the code here, you can actually see what this does. Um, this actually saved me a lot of lot of CSS code. So that actually relates to this here. Um, the reason you can't just like rotate the div is because um, the browser takes the div, say this is the, the div element that I'm rotating. If it were originally laid out up here and then I, I rotated it on its axis over here, um, it's the browser still sets aside like this white space here. Like it still exists here. So you could but it's it maybe, displaying or? it here. And you get this weird thing where the layout still wants like all this content tries to uh, obey the space that's being reserved up here because you've rotated this now out of the way down here. Sure. So um, the writing modes actually solve that for you because they don't reserve that space anymore. So when you change the writing mode to vertical like this, it's like, oh, okay, I know what this is. And I think the, the 180 degree thing was, um, so I will, it would have been writing this way down um, and I just I had to flip the text up, and I ended up with that. So, the, yeah, fantastic. <laughs> Does have uses. Does have uses. So hopefully, Robert, that that answers your question. Um, may not have. Uh, it may have real world practical uses for languages. Uh, maybe even really old ones, like we showed in the, the graphic example. But if you want to just do it for a design flair, it helps too. Um, Jeremy Lickness posted announcing .NET 8 Preview 1. I know. Unbelievable. So, .NET 8. Um, one, one site that I hadn't known of before, and I, I claim my ignorance, you see that themes of .NET link? You see it just near the bottom of the page that you're on right now? See that link there? It says, be sure to check out themes of... Dot yeah, click that. This is a uh, this what this does is it goes through all the uh, GitHub issues. So if you put eight in the quick filter menu there and hit enter, what this will do is show you all the stuff that they're working on relative to, for example, eight stuff, which I'm assuming is .NET eight. Anyways, mm -hmm. they've announced .NET eight preview one, and there's a whole bunch of newness that's coming with it. And you know, I you know I remember .NET three. <laughs> no, I'm like in that mode now. <laughs> but um, .NET eight, you know, we had .NET seven last year at the end of last year, um, and now we're on the road to .NET eight. So with preview one, you get a taste of what's coming, and um, there's a lot of emphasis on you know libs and native AOT and uh, container images and all kinds of newness that's in there. Um, I spoke to um, a few folks about this. They were looking to some of the new types that are in the core libraries. I think system.collections.frozen uh, was something that was looked at as like, you know, frozen dictionary, frozen set collections. That was one that was cited that people were, were mm -hmm. excited about. Um, obviously the, the SDK is getting updated, Linux support's getting better. There's just lots and lots of stuff in here that's uh, kind of worth going. Uh, through and I know that we've talked about these updates before and there's just too much you could do a whole show on this yeah but, um, I could do a whole show just on this one I, I I saw was shiny and clicked on okay there add structural equality and order comparison to common, common collections. collections yeah so like you could have two collections and just two go bags. hey are, are these two bags? things yeah. the same do they have yeah, the yeah. same properties and a number of elements and are all the elements the same without yeah. having to write some massive deep comparison thing to do it that's that's that alone i could probably do a whole show on yep. so yeah. and there's, <laughs> there, there's supposed to be that, there's all kinds of stuff that comes along for the ride with with this update as yeah. part with this preview so you know take you take take a weekend take a week i don't know <laughs> start start reading about what's coming uh, um, there's lots and lots of stuff if you're testing this stuff out to make sure you get the latest version of Visual Studio Preview, because usually these things don't work on the, um, the what do you call it, the mainstream release of Visual Studio. You have to have the preview bits 
for these things to light up inside of the IDE. Uh, but there's a ton of stuff like in .NET MAUI. I have to see what's new in ml.net, uh, yep. ASP.NET Core, and Blazor. I know Blazor United, we talked about that last week a little bit. That is being added. Um, I think these are just samples, though. I, I have to check this out myself to see exactly how much stuff made it in. Mm. Um, but this is kind of like that, uh, what do you call it, meta framework stuff they started adding where you can kind of mix Blazor in as needed to um, to uh, pages and have it load kind of things on demand, which is really cool. It's like isom isometric, isomorphic. isomorphic rendering. So it's, it's rendering things in many different places and um, kind of using things ad hoc as it needs them. So that, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, lots and lots of stuff to chew on there. I'll keep you yeah. busy. And uh, actually, let me move this up a little bit. Yeah, good idea. Good Visual idea. Studio 2022, 17.5 released. It's, it's like when you dump out your bin, you know, it's, it's just all kinds of stuff are coming onto the pile. Like, you know, what? what just stop. There's too many updates. So I know we, we complain, obviously, when there's not enough, but this is getting ridiculous. So Visual Studio 2022, 17.5. You know, Element lots of stuff search. there. Yeah. So much stuff. Faster builds, improved Razor and C Sharp experience. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Like I, I've I've nagged about on this show a million times probably is it and I told you like the, the original concept for this was extremely difficult. So I'm not like putting anybody down for it being in the the uh condition it was in but the razor in c sharp experience um they've been rewriting it from scratch for quite some time and it's been it's been rough <laughs> it's been a rough journey so to see that that's continuing and improving is always always a plus yep. uh, faster so. build times better debugger support all kinds of stuff just like it just keeps going on and on and on so again mm -hmm. another resource worth checking out um this this was interesting john i saw you yeah. post this uh there's yeah, yeah. a place for free and paid starters it's kind of like, yeah. like kind of reminds story. me of uh one of those github repos like uh what is what are they called there's awesome oh there's, awesome project yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so there's kind of like that this, yeah there's like this meme of awesome like awesome HTML5 or awesome.net or awesome CSS. These are just basically link collections of really mm -hmm. good resources. So what starter.place is, it's a place where it's kind of self-describing. Like it's a place where you can kickstart projects um, and it gives you basically the, a list of all the, stem, the templates that you may want to use. And these are all based obviously on um, a variety of products that are there. But if you're looking to basically bootstrap a project and you need a starting mechanism for doing so um there's there's a small there's a small list of projects there it's not it's not super exhausted but um they've got about say 20 or 30 so far but if you're looking for something to you know kickstart your asp.net web application or you're looking to get started with say you know next and tailwind and uh mm -hmm. typescript etc there are those there as well so you can kind of think of these as um akin to you know, th there's a variety of tools out there. Some of the things that I think of are like Yeoman and these generative apps and things like that. So it's kind of a it's kind of like a, a one stop shop for a lot of these things. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, good old uh, JetBrains. We've got. Um, let's see. So, I think the link so, got yeah, lost in is, here. I just basically pointed their blog because I was like, "There's way oh, too okay. many updates." So they they basically came out with a ton of EAPs. So they've got. So JetBrains makes a ton of tools. They make a ton of tools for a different, a, a wide variety of languages, a wide variety mm -hmm. of, of stacks, et cetera. And they basically decided, you know, as, as typical, they just said, all right, here's the massive, you know, update of all of our tooling. So they've got EAPs for uh, their Goland IDE, for ReSharper, or not ReSharper, excuse me, um, for, uh, oh, what is the tool for C? What do they use for C Sharp again? I can't, it's, I'm blanking. I apologize. Anyway, so they got e EAPs for pretty much everything. So I called I called this link the EAP galore, um, basically. So they've they've shipped up to updates and like they recently updated Space. They've got updates for IntelliJ. They've got updates for Dot Trace. They've got updates for PHP Storm. So if there's a tool that you like to use, 
um, from JetBrains. This is this is kind of like Christmas. You know, Reese Harper was the sorry, Reese Harper was the name that I was I was thinking that I got tripped out, but Ryder was the one I was originally thinking of. So I Ryder got updated. Pretty cool. They've got yeah. IntelliJ IDE, a Learn Rust plugin, which uh, if anybody's watching from JetBrains, this this link is he's broke. Oh, there, wait, there it goes. That time it worked. Nope. Second time's a charm. There you go. <laughs> uh, it was 404 a second ago. Uh, so they've got like a Learn Rust plugin. I guess that kind of is a tutorial that plugs into the IDE to teach you Rust. That's pretty pretty darn cool. I like that. Yeah. I might have to check yeah. that out because learning Rust would be fun. So, um, yeah, uh, this is nice, John. Hmm. Uh, looks like they've been busy. Yep, as, as per everyone. All right, and Visual Studio code, code. updates as well. Yep, um, lots of stuff. Lots of stuff that that you know profiles. So, I know. <laughs> there's, just, <sighs> there's just so many things. So they've they've added better accessibility, which I know you're a fan of. Ed, so um, many themes. Yep, of course. They've yeah. got a better search history view, um, which you can now render as a tree view. You can now render inline as a tree view. So when you do searching, it will render out appropriately. Um, they've started adding um, some some tooling that utilizes uh, Copilot. So Copilot mm -hmm. now is as an extension uh, is now integrated and will propagate out through like inline suggestions and other sorts of things. So there's like lots of stuff going on. Um, if you're a fan of, of remote development, um, there's a bunch of extensions there that you can use um, to use things like remote machines and containers and things like that. Um, you know, this profiles thing has really got me intrigued. Yeah. Uh, the reason, um, because of the type of work that I do, it's often presentations sure. involved. Yep. So you could come up with a profile for like conferences where you change, you know, the color scheme, the font size. That's right. All of that stuff to make it more presentation friendly. Yep. And then when you're working, you can swap that back to something that's not so loud. Uh, you know, I don't always need like a 24 plus pixel font size when I'm working. And oftentimes I'll end up just working in that environment because I know I've got a presentation the next day and there's like maybe a day's break in between like the next one. And it's yep. like, oh, I, I don't want to spend the time going back and tweaking these, these yep. you know, visual features just for a day's work. So profiles is awesome. I wonder if Visual Studio has profiles yet. Uh, or if it's just VS Code, but that that's huge. There there was a plugin at one time to get uh, this in Visual Studio proper, but it broke with one of the updates, and I never went back to it. So Aww. hopefully that's getting baked into Visual Studio as well. Um, and then finally, is is this like one of these good old day posts, John? <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, so this this haiku is the is basically well. There was an operating system back in the day called BOS that I used for many years. I used it for my computer science dissertation. Um, I loved it. It was a competitor to to Next back in the day when Apple was mm -hmm. looking at various operating systems. It was basically between B and Next, but I loved B. I loved BOS. I thought it was fantastic. It re it went open source. The company went kablooey and all that sort of stuff. But um, they opened it source and it's been renamed to Haiku, etc. Um, but this is a, a post that I found. It was almost like a, oh, my God, I totally remember this. It was all about how packages were managed in Haiku. I took this so for granted back in the day when I was using it in BOS, basically being able to just go download, grab, download, and install packages within the OS. This is back in the er, like mid to late 90s. Yeah. Like this is, this, is when this predates everything. People and actually like had more than two. Well, we have three operating systems, but still. Like, yeah, yeah. BOS, BS, BOS changed uh, for me the game in a lot of ways in terms of my expectations. There was also the like that, OS warp. <laughs> sure, from IBM. Um, so if you scroll yeah. to the top, I'll show you. I'll show you the thing that that's mentioned around the package. So it's that it's the first. Um, it's the first uh, graphic that you see there. So you see that that first graphic. You can see there's packages listed right there. That mm -hmm. was built right into the operating system. It was amazing. And you could just simply download yeah. and go these packages for, and it was it's basically like, like the app store. Pretty much like an app store, a hundred percent. So um, this was, this was back in the, the late nineties that this was. Which this was a novel idea back then, like. hundred percent, hundred percent. Anyways, I thought it would just be fun to, 
kind of take go back amnesia lane so to speak so yeah. yeah it's 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 like when you see a new feature for like ios come out and you're like yeah windows phone did that 10 years ago like the same yeah, but, but ed, it's tracks kind of the same the, but ed they didn't reimagine it <laughs> That's what it's you like, need to do. Uh, you need to re you need to you need to reimagine it. Ed. That's what you need it's to like, do. Oh, a package store? Oh, okay. <laughs> this is this is great. You, you we we had this. I got it now. I, you got you got to reimagine it, and you have to have a bunch of people in the audience going, "Woo!" That's, it's got to be that's revolutionary. Right. That's right. That's right. Revolutionary. All right, John. That is all the time I've got for today. I've got a meeting to hop over to. So thank you very much, everybody, and we will see you next week. Take care. Bye-bye.